God. So there is obviously a paradigm that God has set, a model that God has set and has educated Adam and Eve to pass on to their children concerning offering up sacrifices to God. But that's obviously been put in place because Abel comes with a sacrifice to God and so does Cain. Now it says that Cain, being a tiller of the ground, he brings what we would say is a grain offering, more than likely, which is in the form of crushed grain in a flour or to be in the could have been even been made into some form of a cake and it's offered up to God, the grain offering. And Abel, being a keeper of the sheep, he brings a lamb to sacrifice. Now, a lot of people try to work out was Abel's sacrifice more pleasing to God because it was a offering of a lamb and obviously it was a the first fruits offering as it says it was the firstborn of his flock that he offered up and of course he also offered up the fat and the fat in the culture going right back was the was actually the the best part they loved the fat but the fat was to be offered up to God grain offerings they were acceptable to God the grain offerings would be offered up and it even says in the Bible that they were offered up like a sweet aroma to the Lord. So really what we're looking at is, well hang on, if, if both of these types of offerings are acceptable to God, why did God say Abel's offering was far better than Cain's? Why did he respect Abel's offering, but found Cain's offering unacceptable. Was it the gift or was it the giver? What was the problem? Go to Hebrews. For those that have their Bibles, go to Hebrews and we'll find the answer. And we find it in Hebrews chapter 11, which of course is the chapter that deals with Heroes of the faith. Now, I just want to read about faith first of all. So, chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now, by faith, there it is. There's the answer to the question. It's right there. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and through it being dead, still speaks. That's beautiful what we see there. You know, when you look through history and you look to the point in Genesis where Abraham is called out from the land of Ur and he's told to go on this journey to a land that God has promised and he steps out by faith. When you read about Abraham, what saved Abraham? It wasn't the things he did outwardly, such as circumcision or in offerings. It was all about faith. Abraham was a man of faith. Abel was a man of faith. Cain, he comes before God with a grain offering. The offering's acceptable to God in the sense of if it's offered up from a heart that is in a right place which then makes a person, when they're in a right place before God, righteous. Abel came with a first fruits offering, his firstborn of his flock of sheep, and he offers it up to God, and the fat along with it. 
But Abel has come before God through faith. He's offering this sacrifice of this lamb up by faith. Faith is the key here. It's all about the way that a man presents themselves when they come to worship God. Abel also bought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain gets very angry. You see, Abel had a good heart. He had a heart that was right before God. He came and gave God his best. It doesn't tell us if Cain gave his best, but that's irrelevant here. It's all about the heart attitude. This is all about the way we present ourselves when we come to worship God. You see, when it comes to worshipping God, God sets the paradigm, the model, of how we are to worship. It is not for man to determine what is good worship before God. Sadly, this is where the church has ended up. We have ended up with man determining what worship looks like. So therefore, we are now seeing churches where they come in to worship God whilst they're having a cup of tea and a bite to eat, or they're coming in and just having a riotous time that is just purely gratifying themselves. They are choosing songs of praise that is determined by them to be good. A lot of the songs today have no theological content. They're not Christ-centred at all. It's all about, I will receive from the Holy Spirit what I want. Oh, bless me, O oh God. When it's supposed to be us blessing God. But Paul got it, didn't he, when he said, we are to offer ourselves what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, for that is your spiritual worship. We were created to worship God. Adam was created and placed in the garden so that he would have fellowship with God and worship God. This is why he's passed on what happened in the garden to Cain and Abel. They would have known what happened to their father and mother, that they were cast out, that they went out of the east of Eden. That's what it says. They went to the east. And they were going to become what? Tillers of the ground. Adam was going to sweat by his brow, digging up and having to provide for himself because God would not provide any more in that sense. But they would labour and they would plant. And the thing is, Cain is a tiller of the land. Interesting, is he? Very interesting. His father, Adam, was a caretaker of the garden and then he goes out and he becomes a tiller of the ground and so does Cain. And Cain, let me tell you, is very much like his father, like his father Adam. He's certainly got the Adamic nature and he's certainly listening to the serpent. So as I said, God determines what worship looks like. In John 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The heart's got to be right before God. You don't just come and do this as something you do because you feel you have to do this. This is what Cain has done when he's come with his offering to God. He's just going through the motions his heart's not right. We know his heart's not right. His heart is in this place of total carnality. He's not walking righteously at all. He's walking like his father, Adam, when he desired the fruit and took of it. Anyone 
empty hearts. Bring empty offerings to God. When God is supposed to be first and utmost in our hearts, when you allow that, when you allow God to be first and upright in your heart, you can't but come offering up the first fruits, the best of who we are and what we have. That's where the heart should be. It should be in the place where you just want to you just want to give your best to God. This is what Abel wanted to do. He just wanted to come in and give the best of what he had. The very best. You know, are you challenged by that? Do you give your first fruits to God? Do you come before God? Do you give him your best? Do you come with your hearts in a place that is right before God? Do you pray before you enter the temple? Do you pray that God would help you have your heart in a right place so that when you offer up your praises, that they'll be acceptable? It's a challenge for all Christians. You know, Isaiah puts it beautifully in Isaiah 29. Verse 13, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths, says the prophet, and honour me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. You see, that's the problem today. Too many Christians have lost the fear of God. They haven't even obtained the fear of God. You know, there's no wisdom in what they do when they come together to corporately worship God. They make it about themselves and not about God. Man needs to get right out of the way when it comes to determining what true worship is in the household of God. God's word tells us how we are to conduct ourselves. Firstly, Paul says, let all things be done decently and in order. Let me tell you, there's some churches I go into and it's utter chaos. Utter chaos. Everyone doing whatever they want to do. They don't come with any reverence. They don't come with all holiness before God. They don't come with humility, but they come with pride. And they centre everything around themselves, which is what Cain will do. And God sets down the paradigm, the model for his church. You go to Acts chapter 2 and here it is. This is the way God expects us to worship him whilst we're here on this earth, whether individually or corporately. This is what he's called us to do. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. He doesn't say like Rick Warren, Bill Hybels, Brian McLaren. He doesn't say that we are to actually immerse ourselves into this generation and become likened by this generation, he says, be saved from this perverse generation. And how perverse is this generation? If I feel like today I want to be a cat, I'll be a cat or a bird. If I want to be female, I'll determine I'm a female even though I'm a male by birth. How perverse has this generation become? Can it become any more perverse? Well, probably, because every time I think it can't, it does. Every time I think Satan has has finally got everybody in his grip, something else comes out. And I sit with further amazement at the stupidity of man. The stupidity of man. 
goes on, verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptised. That's one way we bring worship to God, is that when we are born again, one of the first things we should want to do is identify ourselves with Christ. And we do that through baptism. We are identifying ourselves with Christ and we are now saying we are also becoming members of his household. Then those who gladly received his word were baptised and that day 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly, here it goes, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. There it is. There it is. And that used to be, and I say used to be, the way the church presented itself when it came together in corporate worship. All things were done reverently. All things were decently done. I didn't carry on like a, a bunch of immoral fools and idiots within the temple of God. They didn't present their bodies as, as living rat bags, which is the way that many are today. And I can't put it any other way. When a person is born again, they are born again above. This is the God-inspired word. This is the manual. This gives all the instructions and answers all the questions. Yet man wants to determine what worship looks like. Everyone wants to go in the way of Cain and not of Abel. The church has gone down the way of Cain. You look and when you go on in chapter 4, you will read the genealogy line of Cain. Where does it end up with Lamech? And who is Lamech? The first one that perverts the way that God designed marriage. Interesting, isn't it? Christians throughout all areas they don't even, many of them don't even see, the young ones don't see that they have to get married because in God's eyes they've made that commitment without going through and making any vows before God. And you see, it started right back here. It started back here. The way of Cain is going to lead people down that broad road of destruction. It's going to cause them to be fugitives and vagabonds. Always on the run, never able to settle down, not enough, they can't get enough for themselves. They're going to be looking for what they can get out of this world. And so God sets the paradigm. It's not something that we're to do because we feel we have a religious duty to do it. And we have that in many churches today. People going through the religious duty that they feel they have to do to appease God, such as the Roman Catholics, in the way they look at the seven sacraments that you must keep to appease God, that they place within the justification of faith. These are all lies. Man must come before God and worship God as God is, understanding that it's to be done in holiness and with reverence. It has to obtain the utilising of sending up praises that are worthy to him, hymns, spiritual songs. We come before him with hearts that are rejoicing for the fact that we have salvation through what our Lord and Saviour has done. We come prayerfully before the altar in fellowship together, encouraging and edifying each other. And we break the bread to remember Christ. We should do that each time we come together. 
not as we feel like doing it once a quarter or once a month or once a fortnight. When we come together, we should be breaking bread. The apostles did it daily. We come once a week and we find that it takes too much time and we'd rather have more time to gratify our flesh by putting up a heap of songs that are about me. What about me? So what does Cain do when his offering isn't respected by God? He becomes angry. And the Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you angry? What do you got to be angry about? I'm the one that had their unacceptable praise offered up. So why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? So do what's right. Come with a heart that's right. Come with a, a faith that's strong. A faith that believes God is. If you have a faith that believes God is, you will come with all reverence before him. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. You see, we love to stay in that place of carnality and we just love to say things like and hear the preachers say, well, you're always going to be a sinner. You're saved by grace, so it's okay. It's not okay to keep sinning. It's not okay. You have an empowerment now. It's called the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And that God-given power gives you the power to overcome sin. Oh, it might take a while, it might be a bit of a battle, but you can overcome it. I don't care what the sin is. Because all things are possible with God. Yeah, it's impossible if you do it yourself. Do it under your own strength. Don, you can try to give up smokes for the rest of your life if it's under your, your own strength. But when God comes in, God cleanses the temple and he gives you the power to overcome sin. You are supposed to be pertaining unto perfection. You are supposed to be daily, daily, daily conforming into the image of Christ. If that's not happening, then you're not sanctified and certainly not being sanctified. You are walking in the carnality of your flesh. You have not obtained that gift of faith that really believes. You are walking in the way of Cain. And he gets angry. You know, angry, ang anger, anger is a powerful emotion, isn't it? It's a really powerful emotion. How many people here have sinned in their anger? Okay. We all know what I'm talking about. And this is why we are warned concerning anger. Paul said this to the church of Ephesus, he said, be angry. He said, be angry, so it's okay to be angry. And do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. You see, he got angry. He's already been warned by God that because of the, where his heart's at at this particular point of time, sin lies waiting at the door. The devil is at the door. He's ready to tempt. He's ready to enter. He's ready to set the snare. He's like the roaring lion. He's crouching, waiting for that moment. That moment where weakness enters. Got to be so careful. Don't sin in your anger. You know, I was in the police force. 
And let me tell you, I saw what anger can do. When anger takes hold of a man, what it can cause. Oh, and they become so remorseful after they've done it. They do things that they thought they would never do. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is what? What's one of the fruits of the Spirit? Self-control. You can be angry. You can get angry. Jesus got angry, but he kept control of that anger. Oh, but he went out of control and turned over the tables and whipped them out of the temple. Yes, because what they were doing was totally unrighteous. What they were doing was desecrating the temple. Take control. Don't sin in your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Look where it led Cain. Look where it led him. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. He murdered his own brother. That's what anger can do. That's what jealousy can do. You know, if you start to list the sins of Cain, They go on and on and on. You see, anger and jealousy, it would lead to a calculated, a premeditated murder. This wasn't something that just happened in the spur of the moment. This was premeditated. Cain set out that day to murder his brother. When you go to 1 John, Chapter 3, we're told this from verses 10 to 13. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The way of Cain leads us down a path that only ends up not only destroying yourself through sin but destroying those around you. And many of those that you are called to love become your victims because of you've allowed sin to creep in. You see, when you look at Cain, here comes the next part. This is how I know he was much like his father Adam. After this, he, the Lord comes and says, where is Abel your brother? It's not like God doesn't know. But what happens is he offers him a question. He gives him a chance to confess what he has done. The same as God came along saying, Adam, where are you, Adam? As if God doesn't know. He gave Adam the opportunity to come forth and confess the sin. He does the same with Cain. Where is your brother? He gives him opportunity. There's grace. There's mercy shown to Cain. And it's continually shown to Cain. Cain is worried that others are going to murder him. You've got to remember this is the first blood shed in the Bible that's recorded and it's, it's done by Cain. This is right back at the start of creation. We see how wicked, how quickly uh, man's heart becomes. 
It showed that as soon as they left the garden and went out of the presence of God, sin crept in. And it started accelerating to the point where blood was shed. Innocent blood was shed. This shepherd shed his blood. You know, this is so like Adam, isn't it? So much like his father. You can see the simile there. It's a call to repentance. But what does he do? He lies to God. Lies. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, you are. Yes, you are. The way that we treat one another, the way that we express love to one another is imperative within the Christian faith. This is supposed to be our greatest witness. This is a commandment that our Lord gave us that we should love one another as he has loved us and lay down his life for us. He says, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? God's grace, he's calling Cain, but Cain remains in the lie. Jesus said this, he said, why do you not understand my speech? because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. And Cain has become a son of disobedience, a son of rebellion. He is of his father, the devil. Liars will not inherit the kingdom of God, nor murderers, nor those that are under the deceitful lie of the devil. So it goes on and we see God's further grace. He said to him, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth. He doesn't take Cain's life. He allows Cain to live. He even puts a mark on Cain. We don't know what that mark represents or how people knew it and wouldn't kill him. We know that Cain would still be disobedient to God because God said to him, the land won't be fruitful to you anymore. You're just going to be a fugitive, a vagabond. In other words, just travelling around aimlessly. This was his life. This was the life that God said he was to lead, but he still would disobey God. And he would settle in where? The land of Nod. Which reminds me of a lot of churches. People enter the land of Nod when they come to church. But what we also know is when you study the genealogy line, when you look at where he set up the city of Enoch and everything else, God's judgment comes. God's judgment comes to all. His grace extends for but a period of time. Continual grace was even shown to Cain. Every day that Cain lived was another day that God was giving by grace for Cain to repent and to make himself right before God and allow God to circumcise his heart, to give him a new heart, a heart of righteousness like his brother Abel. So in conclusion, I want to finish with some words of Warren Weasby. Why would God allow, he says, a diabolical murderer like Cain to go free? And he simply sums it up like this, in his mercy. God doesn't give us what we do deserve. Cain deserved to die. He did. He really did. But God showed grace. And in his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. That's the nature of God. God spared Cain's life 
But that wasn't the end, the end of the story. Eventually Cain died and after that came the judgment. We read that in Hebrews 9, verse 27. Listen, the entire civilization that he built was destroyed in the flood and the record of his life is left in Holy Scripture as a warning to anybody who pretends to worship, plays with sin and doesn't take temptation seriously. The way of Cain, which is the way it's described in Jude 11, is not the narrow way that leads to life. James brings a beautiful, absolutely beautiful illustration and I'm going to finish with this scripture and it's James chapter 1 and I'm just going to finish with God's word on the matter. Listen to what he says. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away, listen, by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. His own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lie aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. There's a lot we learn out of the life of Cain and I could preach for hours and go into many other areas. But the thing is, you've got to be careful. It's easy to fall into the way of Cain when God is calling us to the way of Abel. He wants us to be like Abel, offering up praises that are acceptable, coming with hearts that are to worship him, looking to his word, Always looking to his word because his word is what sanctifies you and brings you to salvation. There's no other way. You've got to go in the way of Abel, not in the way of Cain. So be careful. Sin lies at the door. Sin waits, but man is empowered by God and through God to be able to overcome any sin. That's true. And may the Lord bless his word.